Uh -oh, wait, you're wrong thing. All right. Um, so last week we started our study of Nehemiah and his little project that he took on of rebuilding the Jerusalem wall. So we'll kind of review a little bit from last last time just to get started. <clears throat> You know, a couple of objectives for this study, you know, I want us to compare and contrast the culture of, of ancient Persia with, with our 2018 global community. What, what comparisons can we make? What contrasts can we take from it? More importantly, what lessons can we learn from it that, you know, maybe hopefully we will avoid being doomed to repeat? Um, another objective is what can we learn 2,500 years later from Nehemiah that we can apply to our faith in our lives today. So, you know, that's kind of our, our number one objective. How do we translate Nehemiah's story into our faith story? So how do we pull some nuggets out of Nehemiah's story that we can apply to our faith and not just learn some cool project management tools that, you know, Nehemiah was using 2,500 years ago to, to build a stone wall? Um, so we, we spent some time talking a lot about some key concepts and some key players. Um, you know, we talked about what, how can we describe Nehemiah? Um, and we had three key, um, descriptors. He, you know, he was obedient, obedient to God, um, because God sent him a, a message that, you know, Jerusalem's in, in rubble, it's in ruins. Um, he, was, he was very patient because he didn't, um, he didn't kind of just rashly jump into this project. You know, he spent four months praying about it and, and praying and asking God to, to, to create a, a situation where he could talk to the king and, and get um, the king's blessing. And not only get the king's blessing, but kind of get the influence, the king to, to share his influence so he could go and do this safely. Um, he was prepared. Um, so he didn't just spend the four months, you know, praying about this. And, you know, he, he was mentally preparing. He was physically kind of starting to gather resources. Um, so, you know, there, there was, you know, it was prayer with action. Uh, we talked about that he was Jewish born, um, but he, he was born into exile. He, he had no real connection to Jerusalem, uh, other than his heritage. Um, so he was part of the diaspora that, you know, the Jews that had been dispersed through, uh, the Assyrian and Babylonian uh, conquests. Um, the time frame is, you know, he, he lived in the 400 to 500 BC time frame, 500 to 400 BC time frame. I guess I should say that correctly, uh, because he started this project in 445 BC, um, and his job was cupbearer to the king. He, uh, you know, he was the he was the king's wine and food taster. So he was he was a pretty trusted position with the king, um, because you know if if you did a little digging and research, and, and we talked a little about his king King Artaxerxes a little bit, but, but if you kind of look through that whole family tree, and really we can just see it in the Bible, you know there were there was a lot of turnover in royalty, and it was because they were getting killed by their brother or their neighbor or their wife or, you know, somebody was out to get them for power. So Artaxerxes came from a, a pretty, uh, a pretty rough family. Um, probably, they probably originated from lower Maynardville, I'm thinking. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Cock County, we don't know. Uh, probably that area, but. So, you know, he had, he had a trusted position with the king, so he had an opportunity, uh, 
you know, he had the king's ear, but, you know, if he caught the king on a bad day, the, the king would have his head or maybe his ears for, ear, you know, for a necklace. But um, so there, there was a lot of, um, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of stress. Some of those prayers were a little bit stressful at times, I would think. Um, you know, and I think it's important, you know, um, uh, kind of that connection we can make between then and now is that Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem. He didn't, he didn't know. His brother had, had, had come in and told him what they had seen. Um, but uh, Nehemiah had never left um, the kingdom where he was born. So why did he mourn for its demise? We talked about that some, you know, that, that Jewish heritage that, you know, quite possibly he, he as a young person might have encountered uh, Daniel as an old man. There's speculation there. Nothing to prove it, but there could have been, there could have been some, some contact there. Um, so he was kind of, you know, in that group of, of, of Jewish people that were, that were re remaining faithful to their, to their practices, to their heritage, to the law. So, you know, I, I think if, we, if we're trying to translate this story, a question we need to ask ourselves then is, you know, do we mourn for our world or do we just complain about it? And I complain about it a lot. So, but, you know, that, that's an example of, you know, as you look at this, how, how does this relate to me? Um, you know, I've, I've never been to Syria, but, you know, I watched 60 Minutes and was just absolutely, you know, enraged with what goes on in, in the civil war in Syria. So what can I do about it? I don't know. Maybe nothing. Maybe God will send me over there. I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> but anyway, so we left off. Um, oh, and we'll, we'll reference. On the back. Wayne has done a, a, a nice rendition of the wall for us, so we'll reference that coming back. So I just kind of want to show that off. I'd asked him to kind of plot in all the names of all the people where they were working. Uh, Why did they use the dumb gate? We walked through it, so to speak. There's one right here. It's got all the names. There you go. Well I done. I didn't do that though. I, I, I googled that. Nice. Print that out. Would you you want to uh, share that through an email? Yeah, Steve didn't. I won't, have to, I won't call on and embarrass Steve tonight. <laughs> Images. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you get that in the ditch Ridge Cross? No, I got it from Google. Got it from Google. <laughs> so last time we left off um, at the end of chapter two, when Nehemiah kind of nonchalantly strolls into town and starts checking out the state of affairs, you know, in the middle of the night, didn't want anybody to know what's going on. Um, just so he's got a clear understanding, because again, he'd never stepped foot in Jerusalem before, so um, all he had was a, a Google map of what, it, you know, Google Earth picture of what it looked like. So, so he, he was checking out, and, I, and you know, as as we read on in in our reading for this week, you know, he probably had good reason to do that, so that he didn't want to draw any unnecessary attention from some of the neighboring folk um, that we'll talk about. So, so we dive into chapter three and the, the, the children of Israel in, in Jerusalem kind of take off with this project and 
run with it. They're um, exuberant and enthusiastic about it. And, you know, matter of fact, I think they used the word, they worked with it with great enthusiasm at some point. So Nehemiah had, had divvied out the assignments. People were working on the wall. Um, <coughs> You know, when you just cursory read through that section, you just kind of, oh, it's it's almost you almost it's almost like in uh, Jesus's. Like yes, exactly. That's where I was going with that. It's it's the begats because you, you start going into all this. But what jumped out at you when you went back and, and spent some time in chapter three? What seemed to be unique about these work details that you can glean from? The people that were doing the work were working on the wall right near where they lived. So they were taking ownership for their part of the wall. Yeah, they were working in their own neighborhoods. Absolutely. Some of them were, but some of them weren't even in the exactly. living room, so why? Boom. I mean, some of them were, I mean, they didn't live there. Yeah, there's some of them from Jericho, which was yeah. eight miles away. Is that right, Wayne? I defer to no, Wayne from my. No, Closer to 20. Is it? Okay. Yeah. But what struck me was it seemed that they all had different agendas. Um, some more self centered, some more in tune with the downright religious aspect of it, mm -hmm. um, their heritage. You know, one thing that kind of jumped out at me is that it was a wide variety of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got the Talk about the priest first, and you know, sort of the priest, yeah, the sheet gate, and you know, why they did that. Um, I'm glad about why they did that, but, you know, it's like you know, they were next, next, next to um, goldsmiths and next to you know, yeah, just there's a whole wide range of people, and they all, you know, working well together and enthusiastically together. There's one guy and his two daughters, yeah. Under that. Which is unusual. I think. Yeah. I mean, he might yeah. not have any sons. Or he was trying to find them husbands. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, what else? What other? Any? Yeah, it's a little not enough. It's totally probably off the top of what you're looking for, but I think it gives sort of a good picture of what Jerusalem was like then. Yeah. You know, I don't think I've read any place else before that kind of described, included that description. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Jim. You know, because part of the, and we, we touched on this a little bit, that's what, you know, part of the, the strategy by the Babylonians was, you know, you take out the leadership class, the ruling class, um, and, and bring them to, they brought them to Babylon to kind of re-educate them um, and, and try to create, you know, build a, a couple of generations of their culture and then, and then send them back to Jerusalem to carry that Babylonian culture, to create a, a settlement. Um, so, um, you know, that's kind of why the, the Daniels and those people that kind of hung on to their Jewish roots were, were really re rebelling against the system. Um, so the people that were left in Jerusalem were, were the, the priests and because um, they had the Babylonians had no use for the Jewish religion uh, and the goldsmiths, the stonemasons, the, you know, the, the, the laborers. Um, now it also mentioned too that you know there were there were some of the city leaders. So it sounded like they had some of the almost like the neighborhood mm -hmm. precinct captains or whatever. Um, were were so they had they had a semblance of of a of a civic organization, I guess. Um, but we'll we'll maybe dive back into that and just. Um, before we get out of chapter five. Um, one thing I read was is that, you know, probably some parts of the wall were in, not as bad as other parts, but some parts were probably just totally devastated. 
That's what it sounds like. I mean, they had to, they had to find the material. This is like how thick was it? It was like I read somewhere. This is a thick wall, six feet thick or something. So they had to uh, they had to find a lot of material somewhere. And yeah. Talk about the fact that they pulled all the old stones out, even though they were crumbling, and they would put them back into the wall. Um, but they were excited about it. <laughs> um, how do we then, again, and this is a question I'm just going to keep asking over and over again, because, because I want us to, to think about it as, as we, as we go through this, how do we translate this part of the rebuilding process to our faith process? What is it? What does that say to us? What can we take from that? Let me back up just a second. You know, one of the um, one of the things that we equated, you know, Jerusalem to that, you know, makes it uh, metaphorical for 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 our lives and and people around us is, you know, Jerusalem was in ruins. You know the the. The metaphorical translation of that for us is, you know, we've got people around us and or we are, you know, in ruins in our life. You know, we we go through times in our lives where things are in a shambles. Um, so using that kind of as a backdrop, how do we translate this part of the rebuilding process to our to our faith life or our faith process? Well, I think on a broader level, <clears throat> you think of the um, supposed decline of Christianity in the United States. Um, our part in that is to help rebuild. I buy that. I like that. Take it one step further. Where do we where do we do that rebuilding? Kind of based on Nehemiah's in our, example in our towns in, in our neighborhood. In our, yeah. Or sometimes we may be called to go from Jericho <coughs> to Jerusalem. Jim, you got a thought. I was just going to say that to do something. Take action. Yeah, I think really that's what, I mean, what it comes down to. It's like being, being called on to do something. And, um, and, they, uh, and you know, they were doing something in the middle of kind of like what we're doing, you know, in the secular world. world. They were in the middle of a lot of people that didn't want to want to rebuild. Absolutely. It probably wasn't the best environment in the world to you know, feel comfortable about doing that. My thing too is it didn't matter that they were whatever perfumer or priest or servant, they came together as a community of work. And I think that is to me what spoke the loudest was because I tend to want to enslave. To get out there, I'm going to, you know, it takes more than one person. Yeah, it takes a lot of help. You know, because think about it, the, Jerusalem's been in shambles for quite a while. Probably some people may have, their small group might have gone out and tried to rebuild their wall in their neighborhood, you know, out in Farragut, Farragut 6, or the Dung Gate, I think would be the Knoxville equivalent. <laughs> Got that on tape too. Um, How long had it been like this? Like a hundred years? Some it, it's eighty-five to hundred years because it was they were in five sixties. Those when I think when around five sixty-five was when Jerusalem was <laughs> first sacked. Yeah. I'm also going to say something like that, but here on the on the so. Um, yeah, so I have a quick question. Okay, sure. I can't remember. I should, but um, is the Ark of the Covenant was destroyed or disappeared or something, right? Because that was sort of that was where the presence of God was, but it yeah, was, and I don't think it was there. I think at this point it had been destroyed. I think the Ark of the Covenant didn't survive because it was not a part of the Second Temple. 
um, because the Holy of Holies was just the Holy of Holies and it didn't house the Ark any longer. I'm pretty sure. Um, that's a good question. So, you know, in our rebuilding, it takes a lot of help. You know, sometimes we're called to clean up things in our own neighborhood. And God really doesn't care about our status in that. You know, when we're called, we're called. So if we, if we, <laughs> we've got to take a bucket and a broom to the dung gate, then that's where we're going. Um, they're all here early. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so chapter three pretty much just gives us kind of that idea of um, the work is started. They're they're exuberant about it, and they're making a lot of progress because again, it's everybody is pitched in. And it's not just a handful here and a handful there. So then we go to chapter four. And what do Nehemiah and his crew encounter in chapter four? Some resistance. Hostility. Opposition. Mm -hmm. So we run into a couple of new characters. And then there's actually a third one we'll, run in, we'll talk about later. But here we run into Sambalat, or I don't know how to say his name, and Tobiah. Did anybody do any research on those guys? What do we know about them? Governor in that same area. So they were, they basically it was a, it was a power play kind of thing. They, they didn't, with the wall down, you know, <coughs> they felt like they had control of Jerusalem. Wall goes back up, they don't have control. Greedy. Yeah. Um, and they were probably um, trying to play nice with. King Artaxerxes, and, and because they, they were kind of left in place, and they were kind of hunky dory. Their actual titles. There's a Greek word for what they were, and I think the Greek word was uh, a holio, <laughs> which is translated into a hole in today's English, um, because they were not good guys. Here's here's a little deeper into. Yeah, I, I, I edit that out. What, what version was that in? Like? We're not going like, yeah. That was, that was the Old Testament book, Mark. Yes. Quick question. But they were, they were ruling, quote unquote, within um, Adam's Earth's territory. Correct. Right? Okay. Correct. Correct. Um, so here's what I pulled up um, Sambalat the, Hor the Horonite was a Samaritan leader and an official of the Achaemenid Empire of Greater Iran, who lived in the mid to late 5th century BC and was a contemporary of Nehemiah. Tobiah was an Ammonite official, possibly a governor of Ammon and maybe also of Jewish descent. A brief history of the ancestries of these men further highlights the animosity between them and Israel. Both the Moabites and the Ammonites were distant relatives of the Jews having originated from the incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters back in Genesis 19. God had given them a land inheritance on the eastern side of the Jordan and instructed the Israelites not to bother them, not to harass them. That was in, in Deut Deuteronomy. Uh, because they were in his, inhospitable toward Israel and hired Balaam to curse God's people, it was written in the law that no Ammonite or Moabite were to be admitted into the assembly of the Lord. The Samaritans were also antagonistic toward the Jews. When the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom was based in Samaria. Uh, the northern kingdom was based in Samaria. Assyria deposed the northern kingdom and repopulated Samaria with pagans from other nations. During Zerubbabel's leadership, or Zerubbabel's leadership of rebuilding the temple, the, the Samaritans were refused participation, and then they sought to hinder the work. So we read about that in Ezra. Ezra was working on rebuilding the temple and reinstituting um, the law. And, and maybe we'll, we'll look at that. Um, we'll talk about Ezra at the end of this study, and maybe we'll, we'll get into Ezra another time. So... 
Um, you know, this is really nothing new in the Old Testament. I mean, the children of Israel faced opposition just about at every turn. Uh, sometimes they brought it on themselves. Sometimes it was just part of where they were and what they were doing. So um, what, why is it important to this story? And this is kind of a stretch, and this is, I don't know if... Why is it important to what? what? Why is opposition, why is this opposition important to the to this story, to Nehemiah's rebuilding story? Why, why do we... Being involved, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not easy, you know, they're going to have to have God's help in order to get it done. Yeah. And it's not like you just fall off the wall or anything like that. It's not going to be an easy task. <clears throat> yeah. And kind of think for us, it's like how you come by with our lives is anytime you're trying to do anything for God, you're going to have opposition from the world. <coughs> and you have to be prepared for that. Yeah. And also, how do you respond? You know, how yeah. do you react to the opposition? Do you think you're back or? So you're just it's like following what your teacher would do? They were, you know, there's times in here where, you know, where they were, they were feeling down anyway, you know, they're tired. And Work was heavy, and then all of a sudden, you kind of start critical, you know, and you know, you can't really can't do it anyway. So. Yeah, um, you know, there's a beatitude that says, "Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." And you know, I think that was exactly, you know, this was a sign that that they were following God's will, just like Debbie said. Anytime you're trying to do something um, for God, you're gonna you're gonna encounter opposition you're going to encounter you know the world's going to push back um as we get to verse six in chapter four um uh, let me get to the right chapter don't ever get it you may have the desire to get a google pixel if you do, don't. Don't believe the commercials. They're horrible. What is it, a phone? Yeah, the Google Pixel. Uh, yeah, anyway. Somebody else got it? Uh, verse 6? Yeah, verse 6 in chapter 4. Yeah. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mighty work. Yeah. Um... So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. Um, so we're, they're halfway up. Um, so they're, they're about the halfway point. And I mean, I, mean, I don't know what the scale is, but that's covering a lot of ground. Do we have any miles around? I don't. I will defer. Wayne's been there. Steve's been there. I'll let them share. That might have been one mile all the way around. Total? Yeah. That, that, that'd be my guess. Um, but it was thick. It was high. Could so. be more than. Could be two miles. So I don't know. It's pretty good ways. The the broad wall that they are talking about. Well, it's on the map you got. I think it's like right in this area right here, which is thicker than the rest of the world. Um, and part of, part of that is exposed today. You can walk up and look down and see it. Um, got a scale in here that says that equals one mile. If you do that, then that looks like about 20 miles or so perimeter. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the town or the, or the temple? Well, whatever it is, they they kind of got to the halfway point in about twenty six days. So they're 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 three and a half weeks into this, and they're about halfway finished. 
Um, and then we get to verse 7. Um, but when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead, and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Because they'd probably seen this before, you know, little bands of people coming together to try to build a wall back, and, you know, they bullied them a little bit and got them to stop. Um, so that got their attention, that this was starting to, this was starting to, to be a thing. Um, what else happened? Something else happened too. Well, they started hosting guards. Yep, yeah, they, they had another form of opposition that came, you know, they, they had the external opposition, and then what else happened? So they were complaining. Two, two and a half miles. Two and a half miles. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty miles. That must, that must be point one miles. You're off the order of magnitude. <laughs> Larry always thanks me. Yeah. Um, it is point one. It is point one. So I told you you're off that order of right. magnitude. Yeah. So which means that they were. They and now. All right, let's move on from the scale. The <laughs> this in the little miniature railroad. It doesn't matter what scale it is. Can I add, add something? In, for commercial in your, uh, <laughs> can I add something intelligent? Uh, oh, no. Who are you going to ask? Please. Yeah, go ahead. We'll see. Can I rebuttal with something that's not? Yeah. <laughs> Probably you will. What this construction reminded me of was the sea, the sea base because they have to be able to defend whatever they build. And these guys had to do the same thing, had supplies in one hand, a weapon in the other hand. That's a great point. It's like, it's like today's sea base. That's a great point. Um, we knew that. We just didn't think we were that far yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, go ahead, Chris. Oh, the CBs is the construction battalion of the oh. Navy. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. They go in like right <laughs> after the Marines to build buildings, air bases, whatever, bridges, whatever's needed. Go to that. Google the movie, Our Fighting CBs or whatever. Or go so to the old episode. John Wayne or whatever. Of uh, Bob Bob Black Sheep from the seventies, and you can see and whatever the CBs at work with Robert Conrad. Um, all right, so two things going on: they got external opposition from the Aholios, and they got internal not opposition, but you know they're starting to grow a little bit. They're you know they're starting to complain. It's hot. I hadn't changed clothes in three weeks. It's nuts. So, so then how did Nehemiah, how did he address those situations? So we've already talked about it. he posted guards. So he, he, he helped protect them from the external threat. What, how did he address the internal threat? Some guards and some were workers. And as they work, they and their knives or swords or mm -hmm. whatever they had. Gotcha. So, yeah. Well, he was constantly. And he helped them, the poor right? and they supported him. He was constantly encouraging them and reminding them that God was in their life. He kept cast, yeah, he kept recasting the vision in, in, um, um, in verse 14. It says, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. Um, 
So, you know. When you posted people, right, in certain places made them feel more secure. Yeah, so he had guards. They, they went to a 24-hour kind of security system. And it turned um, out that half of them were working then at Kaplan. Yeah, so they were. And then they traded on. Then they traded on. Yeah. But you know, I think the bigger the bigger threat was that internal threat. Because if they quit working, then it, it was done. The, the, the wall was going to be halfway done. It was going to be kind of one of those little short walls like you see in Ireland. Um, so this this I think this this idea that you know, Nehemiah kept recasting and, sh and reminding them of their why. You know, why are we out here? Why are we doing this? I think it was huge. Um, now, it, it was obviously their enemies were real. Um, well, and then they were worried about their families that were lived outside of where they were. And yeah. Nehemiah told them to bring their families mm -hmm. inside the wall and have their serving people guard while they work. Yeah. So thinking about our faith life, what, how, how do we translate that? Because we have internal and external. Um, enemies and opposition. How do we translate that into our faith life? What, what does that look like for us? We've already said, you know, we should expect opposition. If, if we're following God's will, then we're going to have opposition. Have your guard up and carry a big sword. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm guessing what's the that answer like? is not build a wall. <laughs> I'm not talking about building a wall. You're right. Um, what does this look like? When you oppose to us, you know. Try to prevent you know, God work from being done. But then who do we call on? But who do we call on here? I mean, God's that's great, but ne Nehemiah had help. Who, who do, what does our help look like? What's the help look like in your life? Yeah. Trust. Church. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we've got to have that team of. of goldsmiths and neighbors and whatever you know that can help protect our hearts because that's our internal you know um the comedian ron white has a great phrase that i love <laughs> i'm not going to but he talks about his grandfather and he's, no i'm not just hush everybody just hush Ron White. Nice. Nice. I thought it was going to be the one where he gets thrown out of the bar. So, no, he's not. No. Drunk in public. And he was in public until they threw him out. His, uh, his grandfather would describe his grandson and say, yeah, that Ron, he's got a lot of quit in him. Which is something like an old codgety grandfather would say. He's got a lot of quit in him. I mean, we all do. Stuff gets hard. And, and if we're kind of in the middle of a faith crisis or a faith issue or, you know, <clears throat> life's in shambles, what do I do? You, who, who do we call to help guard us, to guard our hearts, to be our encouragers? Um, That's why small groups around here are important. Absolutely. And that's what I think about, like, if you withdraw, then you're not, it's kind of like the taking action thing or stepping out. If you're not at least doing enough to put yourself, you know, in the proximity of those people, they don't even know. You know, those are people I worry about. So they're kind of withdrawn in the... Yeah. The church... Coach Lady, I don't know if they'll ever walk the wall halls and read the walls. <clears throat> One of their mission principles is we believe that all people matter to God and therefore matter to us. Persons outside the church are among God's highest priority. 
some of the other principles and things that Kirk Sperry has is would say go get the rocks and put them on the wall. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good point, Larry. Um you know, so that that's I think that's an important takeaway that you know we, we gotta have our wall building team in place. Uh because when when things are going well and the wall's going up and we're happy, it's all hunky dory. But then, you know, when the dung gate starts creaking, then it's you know we got we got to start you know again like I said working with with with, with your Bible in one hand and a sword in the other. Um, Is that where the old phrase came from when? The Going gets tough, the tough get going. I'm sure it did. <laughs> I'm sure Nehemiah said that on the wall. He was probably. Um, anything else from chapter four that you guys that, that jumped out? Mark, I think it's, um, <coughs> it's kind of it's a lot of great examples, like you're saying. One of the things I think is just amazing is that they, they did all that. I can just see. A lot of people thinking, why? <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, you know, possibly getting killed just to build a wall. What is that really going to do? Is it that important? I mean, come on. We need to live our lives. We need to make money. We need to provide food for our kids. And yeah. And get by. And you're wanting to go to work night and day on those wall. What is that really going to do? I really can imagine it's hard to everybody's dead into it. It was amazing what they did. I mean, fighting off people with one arm and putting logs on. It's just crazy. So. That's a good point. It's probably a pretty good sacrifice for a lot of them, you know, from their jobs and, you know, you know shops or whatever they get. Yeah. Or just the, the act of raising food and, you know, that just that simple basic need. You know, that's a great point, Jana, because from somebody that's kind of been on the church side a couple of different times, those are exactly the things we hear when we talk to people about uh, sacrificing a little bit of time to do something in service to somebody, you know, for other people. It's, wow, you know, God, I'm, I'm just busy. I'm just so busy. I'm just got, stuff. you know, the kids have got soccer and it's this and that. And I just, I, I can't squeeze it in. So, um, that's, a, that's what they say. I'm gonna try it. I'm, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try it sometime. Try it on sometime. See how it works. Um, chapter five. Chapter five is pretty important. Um, and I'm just kind of going to throw it out there. What What do you think makes Chapter Five important? Nice. It's the first recorded uh, pawn shop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's the Vegas guys? The Vegas pawn shop. Yeah. What? Um, Daddy loves greed has been around since day one. What else? What what other observations can we make? What what else can we glean from chapter five that makes it important? Well, people have worked so hard that they have got to the point where they didn't have food. They have worked, like Ken said, they were <coughs> working night and day to the point where they didn't have food to feed their family. That's amazing. Yeah. And that day and age too, they had to grow the food or, or whatever, trade for the food, barter. So, this is talking about beyond that, right? I mean, these are like yeah. people, I mean, they just were mortgaging their property, right. selling children. their kids into slavery and all that kind of stuff just to get right. anything they could do. Yeah. And that, so, in the middle of building the wall, then they're faced with this. Yeah, and, okay, and, so and, it's and like, Mm -hmm. you know, to me, it's like two big things he's got to deal with at one time. So building the wall, that needs to happen. 
you got some people that are not being treated right by you know color shoes. That's got to stop. So, really, I mean, I think this is the first glimpse we really get of what God's intention is for this project. What's the real project? What's the real project God's called Nehemiah to do? Restore community. Yeah, absolutely. So he's, he's rebuilding community. You know, and, and the wall is going to be the physical manifestation of that. And the family together. How would you work with people? You know what I mean? That you normally wouldn't have any kind of connection with. I mean, I'm stuck with people who work with me. You know what I mean? It's like an arranged marriage almost or something. But you, you love them in the end, even though they're completely different to you, right? Um, I wish I could say working with the church was different from one another. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... So yeah, he so th this rebuilding the wall has brought you know the people that are in Jerusalem together as a community, um, you know, and, and and now Nehemiah is starting to address the the the, the infrastructure of what com how communities should treat each other, which is the real those relationships. Um, what else? What are, what else can we glean from? You know, why do you, why did Nehemiah make these economic changes in, in Jerusalem? What was what were his motivations? And I think that was part of it. I think he I think he understood that what he was doing was bigger than the wall. Because all in all, it's just a, another brick in the wall. I was looking for a chance to put that in there. Um, I just thought about this, but because I think the New Testament, you know, it's like sinners and tax collectors. This kind of gives you a deeper picture of what the tax collector did, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's a description of that, so you kind of understand more why they were their own, <laughs> you know, they were named separately than all other sinners. <laughs> There's a special place in sin for them. I mean, obviously it was the right thing to do for them to, you know, to take care of each other. What else could have motivated? Motivated them. Motivated Nehemiah to, 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 to mandate these, these changes in, in the usury and lending and getting the lenders to forgive the interest and pay back the the exorbitant interest. It's a little bit of a trick question because you, you, you got to dig a little bit for this, but they were all, I mean, probably short memories that you know they all came from the same heritage. And they all basically were enslaved. You know, their ancestors were treated that way all at once. So now you got. You know, some of them have prospered and now they're, you know, taking advantage of the ones that are suffering. Mm. And that's just, you know, that's, that's definitely not what God would want. It. Yeah, when you go back, would you, you know, what Nehemiah is taking them back to is the Deuteronomic law that Moses instituted, which, I mean, they, it was specifically talked about lending money and debt and things like that. Um, it, it, I mean, Moses specified they weren't supposed to charge interest, right? Right. Well, one and twelve percent. So many years you were forgiven. Seven years yeah. you're supposed to forgive it. Um. So you know, I, I, again, that's part of that rebuilding and reclaiming the culture um, and the community. What else? Anything else from that? It says that he was governor for 12 years. Mm -hmm. and none of he, he and none of his people, and he must have a pretty big group around him, close to him. But he said he paid, he fed 150 Jewish officials at his table and all the visitors, and he paid for one ox, six sheep or goats, and a large number of poultry. 
he didn't take any food to this governor. He got a certain amount of food, money to buy food, and things. Mm -hmm. He didn't touch any of that. So he so he didn't even take a dollar. Right. And the reason is because of the oppression, right? I mean, yeah. He basically didn't want to increase their suffering. Uh, well, he, it's a great point. he was trying to do it, and somewhere it says, "Because I feared God, I did not act that way." So he had a fear relationship, I guess, and so was trying to do it so God wouldn't be mad at. Him. Um, so that leads to the next question of our next trans <coughs> translation question is what can we take from Nehemiah's leadership and apply it to our lives either as leaders or just as people what kind of a leader was he Mm -hmm. He was compassionate. He took care of his people. He what else? Also respected enough for them to listen to him and to actually go and take an oath with the, the lenders, an oath before the priests. Yeah, you know, that kind of goes back to, you know, God put him in a position to be the cupbearer of the king, so he would have that, that respect. What else? What he, was, else? he was expecting payback. Do what? I just, uh, so what translation are you reading there? Oh, the very last, the very last verse. The very last. Yeah. Now you're adding, you're putting words in his mouth. And blessed So he said, uh, it also says something to the fact that if not, that's fine too, right? No, I yeah. Yeah. Yeah, didn't say that. <laughs> I'm going to give him slack on that because I would, I would be praying a little bit more. Just, just boil down to one simple sentence here. Thank upon me, my God, for good according to all that I've done for these people. Yeah, but he's not saying blessing, he's just saying remember. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Which, I mean, this is sort of rhetorical, but it's sort of not. You know, it's obvious, but I want to talk about it. How do we translate that situation into that? I think, it, and of, of all the story that we've read so far, this little snippet translates directly into our culture today with this usury, with the, you know, the payday lenders. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a problem because it, it creates just the same amount of oppression that they were experiencing, in, you know, 2,500 years ago. Now it gets, uh, you know, it turns into, you know, drugs, sex trade, violence, you know, increased poverty. Um, how do we make those changes that Nehemiah made? There's even people that are in same as debtor's prison. If you owe a hospital, if you owe cars or whatever you owe and you're not paying back, and the lenders get a hold of that. I mean, the ones that buy the loans and start going after you, making mm -hmm. phone calls and all. They can't send you to jail for not paying your bills, but they can get to the courts. And if you don't show up for some of those court cases that are brought before them, then the judges can say, well, if you don't pay, now you're not doing what the court's telling you to do, then you go to jail. Yeah. So there's a lot of pressure that, that people have and they can't get out from under. I think we can show respect to people and uh, to prevent the oppressiveness that goes on. There's some treat the guy at McDonald's the same way you treat the executive of the company. There's a rule, I think it's rule or Kentucky, I could be wrong on the city, but uh, like around here, I mean, they charge you four or five hundred percent interest in essence on those loans. But the people got together and they passed a local rule that the highest interest you can charge is like 28 percent, which is about what you get on a credit card. And so that, that had an effect on in that area where uh, they, they in essence went out of business. And there was a thing before Congress here recently that they wanted to make one change. And if they did that, the people said, no, 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 you can't do that because we would be out of business. It was some kind of change in the interest in the way. Uh, you couldn't loan money to, like if she came and wanted to buy $300 to fix an engine on the car, then I had to be sure that she could pay it back within that month or I couldn't loan it to her. And, and they decided, well, not, we're not going to make that change because that hurt these people that are making these loans. All cash. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's something else. Um, you know, so, so <coughs> I don't know. Maybe. Ask yourself the question like, why are people getting in that debt? And look at like the source of the problem, right? Like, and try to tackle it that way. Like if they're on drugs or something, and you know. But you know, Larry makes a great point that you know it takes a Nehemiah effort where, where a community has to come together and, and address the big part of the problem, and and then the the real hard work is then digging down into that, you know, into the drug problem, the poverty problem, the sex trade. Um, Larry, is the group you're a part of, is it called the Nehemiah Project? It's called Justice Knox. <clears throat> but their theme is using Nehemiah. It's a, their big thing is Nehemiah Action Assembly. And this Justice Knox was started in Knoxville as, as, a, as a response to the, I think it is Louisville where that happened, where the community, a, a similar type group, took on the usury um, lobby in, in Louisville. Um, so, you know, the, there, there are things, you know, people taking action. So, you know, maybe that's something we're called to, to, 
to look at, be a part of, or, or not. Uh, you know, again, it's it's all about what you know. Nehemiah understood what his call from God was, and followed it. And it was to rebuild the community by starting to rebuild the wall. So, um, what what other any any other nuggets or thoughts or observations from? Chapters three, four, or five that we can talk about. I think Nehemiah was guilty. I thought that was interesting when he was telling people we're doing this and shouldn't be doing this. My brothers and I do it. You know, I, I loan money and I supply them with food, and it's not right, but we're not going to do that anymore. So he was part of the problem. And he recognized it, and he <coughs> said, well, "I'm not. I'm going to change." So let's put the whole community. That's a good change. point. That's a good point. I think too, as Seth points out, uh, you know how each of us can use our spiritual gifts to come together each, and contribute each in our own way, just like they did with being a leader, with being a worker, mm -hmm. with being a, a night guard, whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. So, next week, we're going to dive into chapters 6 and 7. So, here's a couple of questions I want us to think about and talk about. How do you respond when your detractors get desperate and play dirty? And then what do you do when the project is completed? So, look at that. You know, and again, try to pay attention to some of the key words and, and maybe key places or key names and, and do a little digging. Um, you know, if, the, if there's a particular word and maybe has a Greek reference, you know, um, take a look at it because some of those Greek translations are, um, there are a lot of different options to choose from. <laughs> so, um, that's it. Then why don't we close with prayer and then we'll head out. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to come together and, and, and to learn um, from your servant, Nehemiah. Lord, we just, um, you know, each of us are looking for, for your will in, in our lives. And I just pray that, um, that you'll continue to, to reveal to us um, how you want us to lead in, 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 the, in, the, in the church, in the community, in our family, Lord, in, in, in the kingdom. And I just, you know, pray that uh, we will take note from Nehemiah and, and, and learn to be uh, patient and prayerful. Um, but also prepared and ready to take action and, and to learn compassion and sacrifice. Lord, be with, um, be with us as, as we leave, as we go to, to work and uh, as we travel and as we, um, you know, deal with all the, the busyness of our day-to-day -day lives and just, Lord, um, help us to, Take time to, to look for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, gang.